Our last story tonight is about a Russian spy, or at least one suspected to be a spy. Russian spies have been feared for decades now. Books have been written and movies made about them. The KGB, which is Russia's intelligence agency, became a global sensation during the Cold War. It ran a sophisticated network of spies across nations. People began admiring the agency and its spies, simply because it gave the best intel agencies of the world a run for their money. And while the Cold War is far behind us, the fear of Russian spies lingers on. Which is why the appearance of a whale off the coast of Sweden has sparked fears within NATO. Their latest fear is this. Has Russia unleashed whale spies on its enemies? That's right. This alleged spy isn't human. It's a friendly, playful, innocent mammal that lurks in the waters. But Russia's rivals believe there's something fishy about the whale. Our next report tells you why. This is a beluga whale, a calm, playful and innocent creature. It's called Voldemir. Why the peculiar name, you ask? Well, it's a pun, a satirical take on the whale's job, which is to spy on Russia's enemies. The Norwegians nicknamed the whale Voldemir to highlight the mammal's association with Russia and its president, Vladimir Putin. The Russian spy whale first made an appearance in 2019. It was believed to have been an agent of the Russian Navy, lurking in the waters of the region to collect information against NATO countries. Now, Voldemir has made a comeback. On Sunday, the whale appeared here, off Sweden's southwestern coast. The whale has been speedily traveling for the past couple of months. Experts believe hormones are driving the whale. Remember, this is a 13 to 14 year old whale whose hormones are peaking. Experts say Voldemir seems to be on the lookout for a partner to mate with. Sebastian Strand, a marine biologist with the One Whale Organization, said this. It could be hormones driving him to find a mate. Or it could be loneliness, as belugas are a very social species. It could be that he's searching for other beluga whales. But now let's answer the all-important question. Why is this whale considered a Russian spy? It's because when Holdemir was first discovered in 2019, off the coast in Norway, it was wearing a harness. A harness that had camera mounts, essentially making it capable of filming underwater. And do you know what was written on the harness? Equipment St. Petersburg. And that was enough evidence for European countries to believe that the whale was up to no good. For context, St. Petersburg is an important city in Russia. So the poor whale became a victim of the classic guilty by association mindset. But the fears of NATO aren't all too exaggerated either. You see, researchers say the whale has clearly been trained. It approaches boats, raises its head above water and finally opens its mouth expecting treats for amusing the onlookers. Norway is particularly concerned. It has issued an advisory. It has asked its citizens to steer clear of the whale and not interact with it. Then there's also Russia's supposed history of training whales to be spies. That's what really bothers Moscow's rivals. Russia has been training marine mammals since the Cold War. But Russia isn't alone. In 2014, Ukraine accused Russia of stealing its military dolphins. Ukraine has been training and deploying dolphins for military operations for years now. It even had a center for training the mammals to perform daring operations. But when it comes to the beluga whales, Russia seems to have a soft spot. Why? Because these whales can perform a variety of jobs, like protecting naval bases, detecting mines and torpedoes, and even assisting naval divers. And there's a history of Russia using these mammals for military purposes, which is why Europe is convinced that Vladimir is a Russian spy, one that needs to be avoided at all costs. The Korean conflict is entering space. North Korea is all set to launch a spy satellite. At least that's what they claim. The launch is slated for next month. It could happen between May 31st and June 11. North Korea has notified Japan of the launch. They say it could affect the waters near the Yellow Sea and the East China Sea. Japan has put its missile defense on alert. The plan is to shoot down any projectile that enters Japanese territory. 
This announcement raises a couple of questions. Why does Pyongyang need a spy satellite? Does it have such technologies? And why is the US and South Korea worried? Kim Jong-un has a long wish list of weapons, like nuclear submarines and intercontinental missiles. A spy satellite was also part of that list. But here's how Pyongyang is justifying it. A spy satellite would help North Korea identify US warplanes and deployments. It would improve the accuracy of any military strike. That's the official explanation. But is North Korea capable of building something like that? They have launched two Earth observation satellites before, one in 2012 and again one in 2016. Neither has sent any pictures back to Earth. Is this spy satellite any different? Experts say it's unlikely. North Korea's state media has released a picture of the so-called spy device. Experts say it's too small to relay high-quality pictures. Why then is Pyongyang bothering to launch it, to test the technology? You see, satellite launchers share a lot in common with long-range missiles. The core technology is same. So launching spy satellites could be an excuse. The real reason could be testing out ballistic missile technology, which, by the way, is illegal. The UN Security Council has banned North Korea from using ballistic technology. So if this launch goes ahead, there will be sanctions, or rather, more sanctions. Japan and South Korea have criticized Pyongyang's plan. They're calling it a serious provocation. So why is Kim Jong-un provoking and why now? Just last week, the US and South Korea conducted live fire drills near North Korea. Four more drills are planned. Both countries are marking 70 years of their alliance, so naturally, Kim Jong-un is angry. He usually escalates when there is a joint drill. But this time, he's got more reasons. South Korea also launched its first commercial-grade satellite last week. The hope is to build and deploy a spy satellite by late 2023. This would give South Korea an edge. So maybe Kim Jong-un is thinking ahead. Maybe he wants to keep the military status quo. But to do that, he will also need outside help. Kim's biggest ally is China. They have refused to comment on the planned launch. Instead, they called for meaningful dialogue. Where does that leave the Korean Peninsula? More volatile than before. Kim Jong-un has carried out 100 missile tests since 2022. In the past, such tests indicated a willingness to talk. It was Kim's way of saying, come to the table. But this time, the dynamics are different. The Ukraine war will be playing on his mind. In the 1990s, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons and look what happened to them. So getting Kim to give up his nukes will be harder than ever. Plus, how interested is the US? Biden has taken a harsher stance than Donald Trump. So no summits and love letters. In fact, last month, he sent a stern warning. Biden said a nuclear attack by North Korea would end the Kim dynasty. He also signed a new security declaration with Seoul. So the dynamics in Korea have changed. South Korea is more assertive now. It has launched a satellite. It is talking about becoming the world's number one arms manufacturer. All this would have unsettled Kim Jong-un. Hence, the satellite launch. Now, there's something else that's making headlines in Japan. Turns out Tokyo has its own party gate scandal. It involves Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's son, Shotaro. He was serving as one of the Prime Minister's advisors. But now, Kishida has succumbed to public pressure and sacked his son. Why? Well, Kishida's heir apparent held a private party last December. This was at the PM's official residence. And new photos from the party have emerged. Shotaro Kishida and his guests are seen being inappropriate. Not in the way you'd expect, though. They were seen posing at a symbolically important place. Yes, that's it. Not exactly what most of us would consider a scandal. But in Japan, it caused an outrage. And it led to the Prime Minister having to fire his political heir. Here's more. This is Shotaro Kishida, eldest son of Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, and his executive policy secretary, but that's set to end this Thursday. Kishida Jr. has got the sack. He's being forced to step down. No, it's not because of the obvious nepotism, but because of a party. Shotaro is facing the music for partying last December. At the Prime Minister's official residence, 
The scandal is about a bonenkai or forget the year party on 30th December. A lot of relatives were invited and pictures from the gathering have been made public. Shataro and his relatives were photographed posing on the red carpeted stairs at the PM's residence with Kishida Jr standing at the center. A place of honor reserved for the prime minister. It has drawn a stream of criticism. Now, this may not seem like much to a lot of people around the world. However, it's a big deal in Japan. The stairs at the PM residence hold a symbolic value. You see, the Prime Minister's residence is a 100-year-old building. It used to serve as the PM's office till 2005. That's when a new office was built and the old building was turned into the PM's living quarters. So the building and the iconic stairs are looked upon with deep respect. Shotaro Kishida posing there is seen as extremely disrespectful. Then there were other pictures. The party goers were also seen standing at a podium as if holding a news conference. All of this has outraged the Japanese people. And their ire was directed at Fumio Kishida. The prime minister is facing flack for his son's actions. His popularity is tanking once again. Kishida has been facing heat continuously during his tenure. A lot of it came after the assassination of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The assassin killed Abe over his links to Japan's controversial Unification Church. It brought scrutiny to the ruling party's links with the organization. Those ties caused Kishida's popularity to tank, but he was overcoming that. In fact, Kishida saw a boost in ratings recently. This was after the recent G7 summit in Hiroshima. Kishida was finally being seen as a true statesman. But then this Bonankai party picture debacle happened. Kishida has no choice but to oust his son from his position. So far, he had kept Shotaro in office despite the optics. He began working for his father in 2020. After all, it's common in Japan to groom one's heir on the job. It's especially common in Japanese politics. You have numerous examples of dynastic politics in the country, like former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. He was the grandson of former Prime Minister Nobusuke Kishi, so the nepotism wasn't too unusual. But Shotaro keeps courting controversy, from using embassy cars for private sightseeing trips to shopping for luxury souvenirs for cabinet members. The Japanese Prime Minister tried to sweep it all under the carpet, but the party photographs were too much for Kishida to ignore. Shotaro is now getting the boot for his inappropriate behavior. Kishida has now said and I quote, his behavior at a public space was inappropriate as someone who is in an official position as political aid. I've decided to replace him for accountability. It's a blow for the Japanese prime minister, but it could be a victory in the fight against nepotism in politics. Speaking of China, All's not going well with the Chinese economy. This year, China's economy was supposed to rebound, but the Communist Party's plans are not working. New problems keep coming up. The latest one is unemployment. It has touched record highs. I have some numbers. Joblessness among youth has hit a record, 20.4%. This was in April. That number is four times higher than China's national unemployment rate. It was around 5.5% last month. Unemployment in urban China is over 20%. These are alarming numbers. Do you know what they mean? About a fifth of China's urban youth is unemployed. Millions more are expected to graduate this year. They will enter the job market. The future for these workers looks uncertain. Either they'll be forced to take up low-paying jobs or they'll remain unemployed. Already the market for job seekers is crowded. I have more numbers to share with you. There are 96 million young workers in China's urban labor force. Out of this, 6 million are unemployed. Once more students graduate, they'll be entering the same market. So expect these numbers to go up. This is a serious problem for the Communist Party. It hails economic prosperity as one of its greatest achievements. Now that same prosperity is under threat. Reviving the Chinese economy is no easy task. For decades, China enjoyed a period of rapid growth. That era is now over. There are clear structural problems to deal with. The property boom is over. There is now an oversupply of apartments. As of February, about 4 million homes were unsold. 
Local governments have been crippled by debt. Do you know how much money they owe? At least $9 trillion. Some provinces are showing signs of distress. They are extending repayment deadlines to avoid default. Some are even calling out defaulters openly. The city of Wuhan is naming and shaming them in hopes to recover some money. We had told you about this yesterday. Chinese households are worried about the future, so they are hoarding cash. Earlier this year, a report came out in China. Household savings rate touched new highs. Last year, it was at 33%. So what does that mean? Chinese households are saving a large chunk of their income. Not because the bank is giving great interest rates, but because they are afraid. They are worried about the economy. They fear they might need to dip into their savings. So they are saving more. All this is bad news for the Communist Party. There is unemployment, consumption is low, spending is down and the market sentiment is negative. All this threatens China's internal stability. China is quite paranoid about this. It sees any form of protest or dissent as a direct challenge to its authority. That's why it crushes any protest swiftly. The legitimacy of the Communist Party's rule is reinforced by economic growth and prosperity. So any distress could fuel a resistance. Already, there is evidence of public anger. Look at these pictures. They're from the Yunnan province. The men in black is Chinese law enforcement. They show up in riot gear. But why? Well, the locals were protesting. Chinese authorities wanted to demolish a mosque. They faced stiff resistance. The locals tried to stop the demolition. This led to clashes. <laughs> Such protests are rare in China, but they are a sign. Not all's well in Xi Jinping's China. Email exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner, and not a former colonist.